as we have done with the previous panels, I am going to just briefly introduce our moderator, who will then take over the panel discussion and introduce her, her panelists and manage today's session. So Dr. Mariam Abdul-Richards serves as the Principal Medical Officer for Institutions with the Ministry of Health in Trinidad and Tobago. In addition to her government role, she is the Director on the Boards of Angostura Holdings Limited, the National Insurance Property and Development Company Limited, NIPTEC, the Eastern Regional Health Authority, TATIL, and TATIL Life. Her extensive involvement extends to several other directorships and committee positions and various government and non-governmental organizations. Miriam, in fact, has a very illustrious career. There's so much that she does. So I invite you to make sure you read through her, her profile that's in the uh, agenda sent to you. But at this point, Miriam, I want to pause my introduction and hand over to you and invite you to take over today's panel discussion as we bring Governance Week Day 1 to an end. Thank you very much, Kamlo. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to really moderate this panel and I'd just like to share some introductions of our three panelists. So I'll start with Gail. Gail Sugaru is the Director and Principal Consultant of Phionics Services Limited and Chairman of the Advisory Committee for Total um, for the TCM Group. J Gail Figaro has created an anchored foundation and solid professional reputation within the business excellence, enterprise risk management, governance, organizational psychology, change management, reputation and resiliency, executive coaching, and the occupational health and safety fields of expertise across the region over the past 23 plus years. She's currently the chairman of the advisory team at, at the TCM Group, as well as a director and principal consultant at Phionic Services Limited. And she is also a registered organizational and business psychologist. Most recently, Gail became the first person in the Caribbean and Latin America, Latin American region to be to have the designation of Chartered Business Excellence Professional. CBEP conferred upon her by the Business Excellence Institute, which is headquartered in Ireland. She holds a Master's of Science degree in Organizational and Business Psychology from the University of Liverpool, among her many other certifications. We can read a lot more about Gail's achievements, especially in regards to her mentoring in the Women in Leadership Program and the work that she's done in terms of course HSSC um, in the agenda that's been provided. I just close by saying that she is the mother of two very brave and dynamic young ladies, and she considers this role to be the defining one in her life. Thank you so much for joining us today, Gail. Thank you. The second um, panelist is Mr. Dennis Harris. He's chair of the board of JMMB Bank Jamaica, JMMB International in Barbados, and the group board risk committee director and chair of the audit committee, Sajiko Financial Company Limited, Jamaica. Dennis is a certified accountant with over 40 years of experience in finance and strategic business management, both locally and internationally. He served as the managing director of Unicoma Jamaica Limited, which operates under the brand courts that we all know and love, Lucky Dollar, Ashley Ready Cash, and Radio Shaft from 2011 until his retirement in August 2021. Dennis has been a key member of the JMMB Group Board since 2000, where he currently chairs the board of JMMB Bank Jamaica, JMMB Bank International and Barbados, and the Group Board Risk Committee. His contributions extend to the Culture and Human Development Committee, where he plays a vital role in shaping organizational culture. Additionally, Dennis serves as an independent director of Sadrico Financial Company Limited, traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and Gallagher Caribbean Group Limited, the largest insurance brokers in the Caribbean. At SFC, he chairs the audit committee, ensuring rigorous financial oversight. Um, we, again, we can read more about Dennis's achievements in our agenda. And um, thank you, Dennis, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Miriam. Our last panelist is Misha. And uh, Misha Loban Clark is the Executive Director of the Barbados Chamber of Commerce and Industry, a role she has held since June 2019. Under her leadership, the BCCI has experienced significant organizational change and repositioning, enhancing its visibility and engagement within the business sector. 
Misha has been instrumental in implementing the Chamber's strategic mandate, ensuring that it effectively represents the diverse interests of its members. Misha has over 25 years of experience in organizational management, corporate governance, communications, and stakeholder management. She's a member of the CCGI and has presented at numerous conferences and training events. And she's also served as a non-executive board member of Stratus Alternative Funds SEC, where she chaired the Corporate Governance, Remuneration, Conduct Review and Nominations Committee for three years. Misha holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Political Science and a Master of Arts in Communication Studies from the University of the West Indies, Mona. Misha is also certified as a trainer in Corporate Governance, Board Leadership by the International Finance Corporation Global Corporate Governance Forum. So ladies and gentlemen, um, again, I'd just like to welcome you to the panel. And um, for today's discussion, we'll start with Gail, please with her presentation, then moving on to Dennis, and then Misha, and then we'll have some engagement between everyone. So handing over to you now, Gail. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks again, it's quite an honor to be with my co-panelists this afternoon. So to get right into it, um, we're discussing or supposed to be focusing on stakeholder, shareholder activism and the value of it. Just so that we're clear, or at least I communicate what my understanding of the topic is, when we're talking about uh, shareholders and stakeholders, of course, your stakeholder is anyone who has an interest in the organization. The shareholder is someone who has some some so some sort of ownership or or vested interest in the organization as a whole. But as I speak, I'll be referring to all of them as stakeholders. And and your stakeholder activism is really um a manifestation of these individuals using their influence to impact uh, a company's business activities. A lot of times your stakeholders are going to be motivated to use this influence to correct management errors or to implement significant changes um, within for company policies. So if we look at um, the linkage to stakeholder activism and the triple bottom line and regenerative capitalism, which are, are the overarching topics um, for this governance week. Uh, John Elkington, uh, his triple bottom line, which obviously focuses on the social, economic, and environmental impacts of business, um, he underscores the importance of stakeholder act activism because um, it, if we ignore it, it ultimately undermines uh, all three aspects of the triple bottom line. It can lead to things like reputational damage, um, financial loss and operational inefficiencies, not to mention a negative impact to governance. In terms of when we look at, step back a bit and we look at regenerative capitalism through the eyes of John Fullerton, he is one that champions um, stakeholder inclusivity um, and long-term sustainability. Um, I think that when we speak of inclusion within the business world, even in seeking to include, um, we limit what that definition can mean. And when we look at our stakeholders, um, and we sometimes like to think of um, being inclusive, and we, we, we limit ourselves to thinking about minorities and disadvantaged demographics, but it can be expanded to include the voices of our stakeholders in an authentic manner as well. I mean, when when organizations fail to appreciate activism, um, they miss out on valuable insights that could actually enhance uh, resilience and sustainability for organizations. And this can ultimately lead to systemic failures and significant long-term consequences. In terms of the ultimate value of our stakeholder activism, I would say that there are a few key points I would like to touch on, um, being mindful of the time allocated to each of us. So first and foremost, what that does is it opens the door for representation of diverse um, interest groups. Uh, we could be looking at local communities, at employees, environmental advocates, et cetera. Um, I think that when we fail to open the doors for the, that kind of engagement, what we do is we create echo chambers 
And it's very difficult to have a clear line of sight in terms of what we need to be paying attention to and looking at if it's just the persons within the boardroom space or the executive leadership space. Um, when we're looking at long-term sustainability, which is also something that comes up when we speak to the concepts of regenerative capitalism, having a stakeholder activist voice there helps us to not be so hyper-focused on the short-term profits, but also look at what success means outside of that revenue bottom line. Um, they definitely, our stakeholders definitely in being um, active in, in using their voices and holding us accountable, really champion. And I know the word has come up in the previous panels, the transparency. And I don't want that to be under, to be uh, something that we're just bantering around. Um, the fact is that transparency lies or lack of transparency is what lies at the roots of a lot of our grievances and issues when it comes to governance. So or having that window of opportunity to have them have a voice is very, very critical. Um, I believe that if we look at risk mit mitigation, innovation and adaptation, um, what our stakeholders tend to do is they tend to challenge the status quo. A good example of that to bring it into the real world is when we were navigating uh, the pandemic there was a lot of call from the stakeholders who were our staff members and employees to look at remote work because it did alleviate a lot of the risk that we perceived was um, we were facing by coming into closed office spaces during the peak of the pandemic. And I think some companies chose to listen to those stakeholders and to pivot. And a lot of them ended up realizing that once they listened and executed upon those ideas and suggestions, they were actually able to see higher markers of productivity um, from their staff members once it was executed responsibly. Uh, you, When we engage our stakeholders um, and we allow them to have that voice, it does enhance the organization's reputation because we are able to build trust equity because it's not just a top-down conversation. We create horizontal and vertical and even diagonal lines of communications. Um, I think that this helps us to also align with global trends because there are those concepts and conversations happening now about ESG and circular economies and regenerative capitalism. And if we want to stay at the tip of the arrow point of change, then we in the Caribbean have to think about how do we align with those forward thinking models. There are also the legal and regulatory compliance aspects that stakeholders tend to hold us very accountable to. And there is also the respect for human rights. I think that while we speak of governance, there are certain topics that don't get as much of a spotlight as they need to. For example, um, when I was navigating my certification for CPAP, one of the statistics that really resonated with me is I had to face the reality that as of 2024, January, um, the stats coming down globally is that we still have just about 49.6 million people globally that are still in modern day slavery. And when we think about that and we ask ourselves, just to, just to make that very real, if I take the population count of my country and the countries of my two co-panelists, Jamaica and Barbados, Jamaica has just under 3 million people, Trinidad about 1.5 million and Barbados about 290,000. That comes up to just about, just under 5 million collectively. What I'm saying is that globally, there's 10 times that amount of people still in modern day slavery. And if we say that we are running an efficient um, organization that is hyper-focused on governance, and we're not questioning if somewhere down our supply chain, there is the presence of something like that, then we're not doing governance thoroughly, right? We're doing it topically because we really need to ask those things. When you think about that number, 
and think about the fact that we get to celebrate something like emancipation. Um, if we really want to talk about doing the things that are, that are right, it's not just about the environment, it's about the people that are in that environment as well. So that moves me to my next point, which is how can companies manage stakeholder um, activism? Well, from a proactive perspective, we can engage them um, and not just wait for when a situation escalates or there is um, a need to pull out a PR strategy to mitigate against fallout. So for example, one of the uh, persons that stands out to me in terms of doing it right is the former CEO of Unilever, which would be Paul uh, Pullman. Um, he had um, an approach to engaging stakeholders through Unilever's sustainable living plan. Um, and he also authored a very interesting book called Net Positive. Um, I believe that Unilever's plan and their addressing the social and environmental concerns that were tabled really helped um, the stakeholders of that organization to understand how much their voices were appreciated. Um, and we were able to see it in living action. Um, another way that we can engage stakeholder activism is to pay attention to the transparency and accountability. I think boards and management need to keep a practice of holding themselves accountable to stakeholders and shareholders alike with clear and honest communication because that ultimately builds not only trust, but credibility. So an, an example of that would be Patagonia. Um, they have a reputation for being very transparent and accountable in terms of being an organization that regularly and without being um, it being demanded of them, they willingly publish detailed reports on their environmental and social impacts. And this over time has created a very loyal customer base for them. Um, in terms of integration of sustainable practices, it is another way that we can engage our stakeholders. Um, IKEA, who is an organization we may be familiar with, furniture store uh, out of the US, they integrate their sustainability into their business model by using renewable and recycled materials. And again, this is an alignment with what their stakeholders have really lobbied for, which is to have more environmentally um, respectful solutions in terms of what they provide. When we do not manage activism, um, or when we manage activism, it's not just about being proactive, it's about dealing with the negative scenarios as well. And when those things do arise, and they will, we need to look at being present and actively listening and acknowledging the concerns. No templated speeches, no PR spins, just actually listen. Um, a good example of that was when um, a while back, I recall that Nike um, had faced some negative stakeholder activism over labor practices that they had. Now, in response to that, they acknowledged the issue, which is something a lot of organizations find difficult to do. They improved their transparency and they did a lot of work in terms of improving the labor standards. And all of that came out of stakeholders um, basically voicing displeasure with a giant entity like Nike who paused to listen to their stakeholders. We also, as, as companies, need to consider engaging in dialogue and collaborating with our stakeholders slash uh, shareholders. So um, Nestle, which is a brand we're, we're very familiar with throughout the Caribbean, um, in the past has also faced activism over their water usage. The company chose to engage at that point when this topic came up with local communities and environmental groups to improve their water management practices. And that demonstrated a commitment to address the concerns which resonated very positively with their base. Um, the power of stakeholder and shareholder act activism is something that we cannot um, ignore. Um, because a lot of companies may be tempted to say, well, um, we don't need to listen to them. We need to understand the power that this demographic carries. A good example of that was back in 2021, when a small activist hedge fund uh, group called Engine Number One led a successful campaign um, 
to replace three of ExxonMobil's board members with persons who had experience in renewable energy and climate change. This was something now, whether it manifested with the intention over time of what was uh, you know, hoped for at that point in time, that's another discussion, but it goes to show how powerful stakeholders can be when they band together they can get to the point of removing board members and disempowering persons who do not listen to them and do not respect the fact that they carry weight within this space. Um, another good example of that is uh, there was a, a point in time a few years ago when stakeholders were really lobbying for Starbucks to ensure that their coffee sourcing practices were ethically and environmentally sustainable. In response to that, Starbucks implemented several initiatives, including their coffee and pharma equity practices, or CAFE for short. Um, such efforts definitely resonated positively and it increased brand loyalty and stakeholder relationships. So that's when companies listen. When they don't listen, just to wrap up my contribution, initial contribution for this evening, when they don't listen, I just want to leave the team with two examples. Um, there is a loss of reputation and trust. So in 2016, news broke that Wells Fargo, uh, Wells Fargo um, had employed, um, they had created millions of unauthorized accounts in order to meet aggressive sales targets. And this revelation led to a huge erosion in trust and millions of dollars in fines and settlement payments and a drastic drop in the company's share price. Again, a real life example of what happens when stakeholders find out that we have not honored our, our responsibilities to serve them ethically. And finally, we are all familiar with Volkswagen and the fact that they faced a similar outcome back in 2015 when it was discovered that regrettably they had installed software in diesel vehicles to cheat emission tests. They ignored the concerns that were previously raised by environmental groups, which is a powerful stakeholder um, in, the, in the grand scheme of things. And they, they elected to not take authentic solution-oriented measures. What resulted there was massive fines and a loss of consumer confidence. And the situation ultimately ended up costing Volkswagen in excess of 30 billion, with a B, dollars. So if we don't pause to think about the power of stakeholder activism, I think that I have tried to offer some examples to those who have decided to join us this evening to really pause and see the real life impact. It's not just theoretical. There is huge fallout when we don't do that and we don't respect the fact that these people deserve to have a voice and a space. And if we don't want to deal with the 11th plague of their anger <laughs> or their disappointment in us, then we just have to show up and do the right thing from the start. So with that, I will close off my initial offering and hand back over to our moderator. Thank you very much, Gail. A lot of interesting points. So I've taken some notes and we will discuss further um, when we move to that joint session. Um, now I'll I'll ask um, Dennis to share his perspectives on stakeholder activism. Right. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I know for lots it's been a long day and we're coming down to the end of it. Um, but this is a really sort of interesting subject. And, you know, I really want to thank CCGI for allow me to participate today and really to complicate, compliment Kamala and the team for the work being done um, to drive change in the, in the Caribbean. Um, I think I want to add to my profile in that, you know, I've done several CCGI courses. So I feel, I feel, I feel very sort of knowledgeable about some of the things that, you know, we're talking about and, and how to manage board. Um, Really, I appreciate today of something that came out earlier about the recognition of the, you know, the three Ps, the people, the planet, and the profit. Um, and I think that is important to me as, as it relates to, as, especially as it relates to investors in, in business, right? Um, and really, I think Felicia Lynch talked about the focus of business about value creation. Um, 
but I don't think necessarily that all stakeholders think about it in, in that way, right? Um, today, I read an article about Southwest Airlines um, who wanted to remove the CEO and the chairman because they believe Southwest Airlines um, is underperforming the market um, in, in, in Rome, and, and they're one of the worst performers um, when it comes to the, the airline sector, right? So the question, why is it that important about activism? Um, and, and to me, it really forms a, a, an essential part of the corporate governance um, because it, with it, you're actually empowering shareholders and stakeholders um, to actually interface with a customer and engage with the customer about things that they feel that is important. Um, the also other part of it, of course, is the regulatory pressures uh, for, for a lot of companies, uh, especially in the financial or business sector, that that really under high scrutiny uh, in terms of what, what they're doing. And to me, you know, the directors ignore this at their at their peril. Um, Mark Mobius, uh, who's a fund manager, said shareholders activism is not a privilege. It is a right and a responsibility. When we invest in a company, we own part of that company and we are partially responsible for how that company progresses. If we believe there is something going wrong with the company, then we as shareholders must become active and vocal. Um, and I hear a lot today talk about, you know, directors, responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there, there is a lot about that. Um, however, I think directors need to recognize that if you don't perform, you may be actually no longer be a, a, a director. And we know that the situation in the Caribbean may be slightly different, um, but ultimately a, a shareholder can decide that I don't want you to, to be a director any longer, right? Um, so the purpose really is really to drive, you know, to aim to drive management and boards to make changes in the way the company operates with the objective of improving value. Now, that, that improvement in value depends on who the stakeholder is um, and how they measure that value. And, and for an example, um, we have two investors in, in, in the US, which are, which are edge funds um, and venture capitalists. Now, edge funds have, I'm uh, sorry, pension fund, edge funds, and venture capitalists. Now, pe pension funds have much longer term horizon in terms of their outlook for performance of a, a company, while hedge funds and venture capitalists are about short term, right? So they have the same objective, but the time horizons are, are very different. And of course, that impacts how a company puts its strategy together on that. So it could impact, shareholders could impact the strategy of a business, but not necessarily to the long-term benefit of, of stakeholders, right? Um, so what are those things that are, impact our value, of course, the, the board structure and composition, um, and you know, diversity being the issue. And I'll talk a bit about more about that later. Um, how do we manage a business from a controlled perspective? Do we have, end up having to do restatement of financial numbers? How, how is that managed? Um, also, where does the company invest, right? Um, and you know, I think Gail alluded to that in terms of our presentation. You know, are people now investment investing in things like fossil fuels and tobacco? Um, banks are under a lot of pressure because they are invested in oil companies, right? Um, there's a lot of activism around Israel and Gaza, even within the within US colleges, and where those colleges are putting are putting their money. Um, Gail also mentioned Wells Fargo, who recently um, had to address shareholders regarding where they, their, their political spend. And IBM, you know, the shareholders want them to set emissions targets um, in order to, to run their business. Um, I was at a, an AGM last week um, in Barbados um, for a public company. Um, and one of the shareholders raised a legal case that, that was actually reported in the newspaper. Um, and they thought that the company should compensate shareholders for what appeared to be a bad, a bad decision that was made um, for 20, over 20, 30 years ago. Um, so people are making noise around this thing, right? Um, 
I think activists in the UK disrupted the Lloyds Banking Group annual shareholder meeting, um, protesting against um, alleged provision of financial service to defense firms, which are linked to violence in the Middle East. So people are take, taking platforms for a wide variety of, of issues that they feel that is, is critical to them. And, and, and therefore it can become a challenge to directors um, and management in terms of who do you address, especially if there's multiple people seeking their, own, their, their agenda and what needs, needs to be done. Okay? Now, we can talk about the evolution of shareholder stakeholders or activism. We know that in first world countries, they're far more developed, um, say that than in than in the Caribbean. And there's lots of cases right now. We, I talked about pension funds previously. Now, in the U.S., you realize that pension funds and mutual funds they actually own forty percent of the shareholding of of the listed companies. So they are a very powerful body uh, in terms of looking at the direction that those that those companies take. In the Caribbean, we're really at an embryonic stage in development of, of activism. Um, now, we talked about it in previous sessions somewhat, but the difficulty is that many of our companies are majority family owned and, 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 and are so controlled, right? So they can literally ignore the overtures of minorities, right? Because they don't believe that is, it's in their best interest. So the noise will go away. Right, um, and I know, I know all it is is just an echo chamber, echo chamber as someone mentioned earlier. <clears throat> Individuals who try and raise issues are often seen as as, as just a pain, right? Um, but I know we have persons like in Jamaica and in Trinidad, who, they just own a few shares, right? But that gives them the right to come and challenge directors and management at, at AGMs and meetings. Um, and, that will, and that will not change, right? I know there are companies that refuses to join things like the stock exchange um, because they don't want to to avoid the possible, possible scrutiny, right? Um, right. So th that that is also something that that people look at and directors and owners look at, right? Um, we also talked about board composition, right? And many companies that same share the same independent directors. Now that is a problem within the Caribbean because the pool of independent directors um, are relatively small, right? Um, and there's potentially a lot of conflicts of interest that are there that you have to overcome to become an independent director. Um, and, and I speak to people and they say, well, you know, we're looking, but we just cannot find the right, the right person because of their linkages to others. Um, it becomes difficult. So what are the main areas for activism? And I'm trying to, to identify those. And they, you know, one of the big things is mergers and acquisition about creating greater value, right? Um, I think Barclays done some research and they said 49% of campaigns in, in 2023 was about mergers and acquisition um, and getting companies to actually look at be, buying or acquiring or merging with another company in order to create greater value. Um, other thing was ESG, and we talked about that, that as well. And as I said, the one share approach, they just need to have one share to have a voice as well. Um, the other thing is executive pay. Um, and where those pay structures are not linked to, to company performance. We've had two recent thing in the, in the Caribbean, both with NCB and Massey, where um, CEOs are paid, are paid a lot of money um, and as they were leaving the company. And there's lots of pushback and criticism of how the, the company has been run um, that they had, to, they had to do this, right? Um, and of course, the other thing is company strategy, not making a, not making a good return. Um, and edge funds in particular, they take stays in companies so that they can actually influence that because they want to make the company valuable so they can actually sell sell it off and 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 make lots of money right and of course we talk about overall strategy as i said that's what we mean about strategy and what you know changing directors and management to influence that strategy right um there's an article in november 2020 by uh, by, by wharton professor 
um, who said in Q2 2020, half of all shareholder act activist campaigns in, involve addressing issues within boards or management teams, compared to 33% earlier in the year and during all of 2019. The cited reason was a greater focus on leadership, whether or not those at the top were ably steering the firm through the crisis. As you know, 2020 was to the pandemic, right? And therefore people were very unhappy in terms of what was happening with their companies um, and were they getting the right, the seen getting the right message across in terms of the, the direction, right? Um, Gail talked about um, addressing the issue of activism and the activist, right? But the, um, one of the Wharton professors um, said, legally, it is the board of directors and management who are responsible for managing the company and the shareholders have limited ability to influence these individuals. That may or may not be the case, but I, I think shareholders are getting greater influence, especially in the develop, developed world. Um, but really, company has to demonstrate that they take the matter seriously. They must have the necessary structure and governance, right, um, to manage that this, that situation. And this applies not only to international companies, but also to Caribbean companies also. And and of course, I have to keep up to date with changes in the overall business environment. The other thing, and I think Gil Todd also touched on about anticipating the activists. That's a responsibility of of, of directors. Um, and I know in one instance, uh, as a director of a quality company, where there's a certain individual, and before we go to an AGM, we actually get that person in, the management get that person in, to find out if there's anything that they were particularly concerned about, um, so that they can uh, address the issues even before then. It doesn't stop them from talk, raising it, but, but at least it's something that, that they're prepared to deal with. Um, and finally, of course, know your shareholders. What is it that their, their objectives are? What is it that they that they want? You know, is it just about greater dividend? Is, is it about diversity? What are these things that they that they seem to be dissatisfied with? So, the future, right? And I I, I think this movement is in a in a position right now which can can make it under on a cha challenging, right? Um, we know that Ron DeSantis in Florida as as created a pushback against the woke movement, um, and which he declared as war on wokeness. And others are following in his footsteps. And organizations are reducing or eliminating diversity functions, right? So to them, that diversity is, I, I think has gone maybe just too far. Um, a, a gentleman writer, Bill Ackerman say, said, in that, DEI is inherently a racist, an illegal movement in its implementation, even if it purports to work on behalf of the so-called oppressed. And of course, um, you know, a famous Elon Musk, uh, he said DEI, because it discriminates on the basis of race, gender, and many other factors, is not merely immoral, it is also illegal. So the whole DEI movement currently, I believe is, is, is actually under threat. Um, and may need to regroup and, and, and come again, so to speak. So I'm just going to close, as, we just, as I mentioned, um, Elon Musk. And, you know, I think last week, the Tesla shareholders approved Elon Musk's um, 2018 stock option compensation package, which is worth $56 billion uh, at, at the annual meeting. Of course, this is still subject to court approval, but he, he, he's got it through, through the shareholders. And, and you wonder you wonder why. Um, and as part of it, the shareholders also voted against several proposals aimed to improve in Tesla's ESG standards, right? Um, they said, no, that's not what I want. And in fact, the company decided to reincorporate the company um, back in Texas, right? Um, there was also a proposal, a proposal that was defeated that, they want, that someone wanted to link the CEO's pay package to ESG performance, right? Um, so, there, there, there are some um, lots of pluses out there, but there are some negatives out there in terms of what's happening um, with, with shareholders' activism. Um, and so, you know, us within the Caribbean have to be prepared to look at all of these and how we can therefore engage um, the shareholders and directors of these companies to make to make a difference.
That's okay, it. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks a lot, Sam. Thanks. Some very rich insights and perspectives about shareholder activism. And again, I have some interesting points. But just to ponder on, Dennis, you know, we'd have to ask, you know, when, what is enough shareholder activism? When is it enough? Um, now we're well, moving on to Misha, who will be our final panelist on today's discussion. And then we will start the engagement between our panelists with some conversation and then take some questions and perspectives from our attendees. So Misha, on to you now. Thank you, Mariam. And I'd like to just start um, firstly by acknowledging and once again, congratulating CCGI for another, I think, thought think already thought-provoking and stimulating governance week. Um, again, I, I, I really do have to applaud CCGI for the way they have continued to promote um, and, 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 and um, lead um, in the advancing advancement of um, good corporate governance practices across the region. I'd, I'd like to... I'd like to present my view perspectives by, by, by just placing or taking a different look at the fact that I, I feel that shareholder activism and, and stakeholder activism differ in some respect. There is an interesting interplay between both, certainly, but I feel that shareholder activism really has that, that power to um, trigger what we call the kind of evolutionary changes that are necessary at the very top, um, whether it is to, to, to in, in influence change in the management structure, the board structure and composition, or even the company strategy, whereas it is, it is argued that certainly ESG, for example, yes, it is um, pushed by stakeholder activism, but at the end of the day, you know, the, 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 the stakeholder can put pressure and bring to bear influence, but the impacts can be more short term rather than long term and, 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 and intrinsic changes that are that are necessary. And I and I and I want to use as a case study the, the 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 and to show the difference the the case of NCB, um, when we look at stakeholder activism, I would argue that that really is stems from what you call institutional ownership by, by investors and their own um, growing demand for, for, for improved governance, a greater accountability and disclosures, and, and what they see as, let's say, customer values, because at the end of the day, their interest is in um, increasing stock value for them and and, hold, and and ensuring the sustainability of the company um, and that at the end of the day will be paying them dividend. And, and therefore, their interest, in, in my view, differs somewhat from... Um, Stakeholder, stakeholder activism, and and I use the, the the and I think it is really such an interesting case study, the NCB commercial um, group where, so they were experiencing over a period of five years, you know, um, practically negative negative financial uh, positions from the operations and the the major stakeholder. And uh, certainly, there was growing dissatisfaction from 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 stake the, the shareholder, and so the the primary or principal stakeholder, who is the chairman, decided to step in and take over the reins of leadership. And and in the media, it was there, you know, he's quoted as saying that he's the largest um, shareholder, and the group has not paid dividend. Um, to its to its shareholders since May 2021, but his concern and and he did articulate that he was not only speaking on behalf of himself but other shareholders, including pensioners, um, because in his view certainly they all depend on income from dividends. But he went beyond that to speak to the fact that um, the, the the group needed to improve its governance and efficiency uh, and and its efficiency because I think it was um, Dennis who alluded to the fact of the 
the kind of compensation packages versus the fact that their dividends were not being paid by shareholders. And the, the outcome of his own activism led to certainly under his leadership already, it was quoted in the papers that la by, by last year, there were they were already seen in, in, in terms of the strategy that they implemented, they were to cut um, costs, 15 billion in costs, and um, for example, was showing um, resulting in the fact that by a year end they projected to be able to pay dividends, and not only that, but he had the power uh, uh, in assuming the executive responsibility to then result in some changes in the management structure and leading the, the a greater focus on improving in efficiency, improving um, um, governance, and what he called was was customer care. He he coined that 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 reference was called ECG and uh, instead of ESG. Um and, and, and therefore that's one example that I would say gives power to what shareholder activism can 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 do. I'd like to also posit that I feel that um there is a and, and I'm and I'm aligning this to the whole theme of this concept, regenerative um, capitalism. But I would like to say that the rise in 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 shareholder activism is also, I feel, stimulated by a, this concept called conscious capitalism. And I, I'd like to argue that before we can get to the regenerative that um, um, discuss uh, this. Um, panelists before me have, have alluded to the fact that it calls for some kind of radical systemic changes. I think we have to go to the consciousness because it's we have to start with the consciousness before we can even get to the kind of action that is needed, whether it is disruptive, whether it's evolutionary, but we have to start with the consciousness. And the, the, the conscious capitalism posits that businesses can no longer be driven primarily by profits. Um, it is certainly aligned to what John Elkinton, to Elkinton's triple bottom line speaks to. But it speaks to um, what the authors of conscious capitalism argue is that the, the capitalists would, would, must have that clear purpose beyond just making money. It, it, in some way, all of it ties back into discussions that I heard earlier today. But the conscious business has to begin, has to actually start again with the conscious leader. The conscious leaders, whether at the board level, um, the, 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 the shareholder, um, understanding that the, that business enterprise, the commercial enterprise, um, is 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 um is impacted not just by by profits or driven not but just by, by profits but how that commercial enterprise impact on its employees suppliers customers and communities and so the conscious business business and and conscious business leader argues that it is more stakeholder focused and here is where that is the interesting interplay that i speak to between stakeholder and shareholder because it says that those who are driving at the top then are no no longer primarily motivated by um profits but they are motivated by the purpose of the business the service to its stakeholders rather than just power and personal enrichment. So that's one, one, one thing that I'd like to put forward. Now, in terms of shareholder activism, um, stakeholder activism, I can, I can say that, yes, it has a power to influence, but more, I think it more influences the corporate social responsibility of a, of a company. And if that company, to me, is a conscious business, then it then translates to further action by the, by by enhancing governance among its leadership um, and, and 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 the board and at the board level. So um, I in term, I I still say yes. There is great value in 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 stakeholder activism to kind of catalyze change but it may not necessarily allow for that change to happen 
as immediate because of the kind of power and influence that resides more in the in the hands of a of a shareholder rather than a stakeholder. Um, thankfully, I think in this current age, the there the, there's increasing value and impact. Yes, and I and and I think it was Gail who said it on um, stakeholder activism, and I can cite one because. Well, um, one, one example I can cite is, is the pair in Barbados, where the stakeholder pressure on Sandals Resort um, International le eventually led to a greater focus by, by the, the hotel chain to, 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 to focus more on sustainable tourism and environmental um, cons conservation. And then the outcome in terms of when I talk about long-term meaningful change is that that also catalyzed um, more eco-friendly practices and increased um, corporate, corporate, corporate social responsibility activities, not just by Sandals, but by other hotels here in, in Barbados. Um, so the second point I wanted to make in, 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 in what, in, from my perspective is that there is a school of thought that, that argues that um, can we really effectively measure um, or assess um, the these two kind of impacts when we look at small in the context of small island development developing states? Because yes, in this in the in the in the case of shareholder activism, it certainly will, can lead to improved financial um, performance, greater shareholder value. And as I mentioned earlier, changing the board composition, et cetera, and enhancing fundamentally what 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 is what is critical and that is governance, because the governance model is what really drives everything else. Um, certainly stakeholder activism um in summary does have positive impact in in in, in challenging corporate social responsibility challenging social consciousness, challenging companies to look at how their, their, their social and environmental decisions impact um, um, their, the community and the people um, um, in the communities in which they operate and function, and even influence them to, to think about the, the, the value of their brand and protecting and managing brand their, their 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 brand reputation, but there is still, as I said, there's still a school of thought that questions whether or not the activism, particularly those of stakeholder, can re result in long term regenerative actions. That I think is the, the the whole theme of 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 today, and and I say that because. When we look in the context of Barbados and the rest of the region, the effectiveness of activism, activism is impacted by, and I think Dennis alluded to it, is impacted by certainly the, the reality that many, many private sector companies, the ownership structures are concentrated in, in, in the hands of a few shareholders. They wield the significant powers. Um, and therefore minor, minority shareholders may not necessarily have the ability to influence the decision-making process. But thankfully, I think there is a rise in the consciousness of even these the larger stakeholders, because of course, you have the pressures of ESG, for example, the pressures of the sustainability agenda. Um, and, and these are global, global um, imperatives that are forcing shareholders and directors to rethink, rethink strategies. There's also market size and structure. And I think that the, the, the small size of the Caribbean markets and the fact that we there, there is still a prevalence of family owned businesses can somewhat in, um, reduce the impact of, 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 let's say shareholder activism. Um, there's also the fact that government ownership, we have to consider that, that they also have ownership in, in many sectors and, and also can limit um, activist influence. 
but I, I will end by saying, yes, I do believe in uh, my view that there is power, there is value in both shareholder and stakeholder activism to be driving the changes in the governance models that we need, driving um, businesses to rethink their models and, and make the kind of shifts that we have been arguing all, 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 um, since yesterday and, and even today. Um, I will close by mentioning what I think are, are the future trends, and, and I am aligned with Dennis's view, and say these two things, that I believe that um, there is a paradigm shift and there is need for a paradigm shift for, for, for um, companies um, to begin to look at sustainability and look at this, this, their, their models within the context of sustainability and how it impacts people and communities and the environment. And that certainly is why um, this, this the, the whole push behind ESG and the need for, for accountability. But I will say this, that while, gov while governance, environmental and so social responsibility are imperatives, I think for small island developing states like ours, it 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 and I and I sit in in boardrooms and hear it, the the concern that the kind of disclosure and and ESG requirements is not necessarily fit for purpose for the small and medium sized enterprises in the region. There is need for for it to be made fit for purpose so that it can be implemented in, implementable in our region. And finally. I, 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 there was an interesting point that was made on Sunday, and I and I and I and I took strong note of it. And it it was someone posted in the chat that maybe regenerative capitalism is calling us to also think about a concept called regenerative governance. And and I am aligned with such thinking because sometimes change requires disruptive. Um, disrupting culture, disrupting norms, and rethinking models. And if we are to, to, to begin to think about regenerative capitalism, we also have to then have leaders, shareholders, board of directors who are willing to also have a different paradigm shift in terms of what is what 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 is really governance. And how do we and, and and ensure that governance is embedding within its framework um, something totally different from what we we have here today? So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Misha, and thank you to our three panelists for some very rich perspectives into shareholder and stakeholder activism and the impact on organizations, especially given the volatilities that organizational entities and entities are exposed to in the post-pandemic reality. Um, I just have a couple of comments and I'd like to throw them out for further discussion. Gail made an, she used an interesting term when she gave um, her presentation and she spoke about trust equity and that shareholder activism brings about trust equity. Very interesting governance term. It brings a soft side. It really speaks to that. And then when um, Dennis was speaking, you know, he was speaking about rights and responsibilities of stakeholders and shareholders. And, you know, a kind of um, a discussion and a point was raised about what happens when you have minority shareholders, you know, how much rights do they have? And then, um, you know, when exactly, and this is out to the panel, when exactly does stakeholder activism become too much? What exactly is responsible stakeholder activism? Because then, you know, we, ha we have to look at the balance and we have to look at the continuing function and function and overall success of the entity. But then we also have to consider all of these views. So when is that noise too much? Miriam, I, 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 you've made a very, very good point. Um, and and I think your the point you made 
call brings to my mind the whole call for even eth eth ethics and governance um or even around how social media is used um because you'll have um interest groups or stakeholders and 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 the 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 the, this, the age that we're in also allows for people to do reputational damage to companies be, just because they have a platform to use. And, and therefore, I, I agree with you that um, the, in all of our, our discussions on, on the power or, or influence of, of stakeholder um, activism, we have to ask that very important question that you asked just now about the extent to which um, there needs also to be, yes, um, some responsibility being being placed on the the um, the stakeholder in 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 terms of responsible activism. Um, but surely, I, I think isn't isn't it all somewhat related to context? Um, and, or as an example, uh, on a board, and um, we had one shareholder um, over several years who raised the issue of the board diversity, right? Um, and it's not a major shareholder, right, by any means, but the board recognized that that was an important for us in terms of having that, that diversity. And 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 said to address that. So those contexts, I, I don't think it's it's is is too much because especially when the board actually is willing to accept what what is going on. So, but there are some that like I said who just becomes can become somewhat disruptive and requires you to change your strategy. Um, that's there that you that it's it's going to be up to the board to decide how you you tackle those. I think engagement, yeah, I stakeholder think... engagement becomes very critical. My, my apologies, Gail. Um, just to answer Dennis, that I think stakeholder engagement, that's where stakeholder engagement by corporate entities become extremely important. Miriam, I do think that, um, so interestingly enough, I'm going to quote you. There was something you said um, at the Women in Leadership, uh, which I think applies here. I think it's important for organizations to not react, but to pause and respond. I think that when organizations find themselves anxiously seeking to respond to every stakeholder or shareholder um, that may be rumbling, that says a couple of things about the organization. It says that they're not anchored in terms of what their strategy is for dealing with the stakeholder shareholder dynamic. It may mm -hmm. it may infer that they're not creating enough space for the type of feedback they want to come in to really guide them and add that balance so that there's not that power tilt that sits only with the board. And I think when you see organizations getting really anxious and wanting to um, just react, react, react to everything that they perceive might be negative. It puts them at a disadvantage and it, it kind of has them on the on their back foot, as we would say colloquially a lot. So I think that in order to bring that balance so that it doesn't seem like too much, what we have to do is really think about what is the reality that we're facing in terms of stakeholder, shareholder voices. And we also have to sit in a space of realizing that what we were accustomed to dealing with in the years gone by that is evolving and changing because some one of my colleagues spoke to it in terms of, I think it was um, Misha, in terms of the digital space, um, the platforms that have now been created now give certain stakeholders power where they didn't have power before. And we cannot <laughs> dismiss what that power is. It, we can't shut them down because... I can use very carefully, I can use the example of TSCT in Trinidad. You know, when they faced their um, cybersecurity exposure, it was the voices of the persons on social media that created a maelstrom of um, pushback and questions and, and in some cases, accusations that caused the entity to feel like they needed to respond 
in in a in, in a timeline and in a manner that maybe if a pause had been taken to respond and not just react, you know, some of the fallout may have been contained. So it's a very real life thing that I think we have to acknowledge that we're in a time now where persons can jump online and they can reach enough persons to cause a company to feel like it needs to bend the knee when if it just has the proper structures in place, they may not be placed in that position. Or even if they are, there is a template to respond responsibly and to still send that message that we are in control of this entity. We hear you, but what we're not going to do is we're not going to be um, always pretzeling ourselves to please you because to please you may mean that we're giving up something that is fundamentally right in the long term. So I do think that we need to kind of acknowledge the tides that are sh sh shifting and changing now and what we need to do to create that balance that you asked about. Yeah, I mean, I, I think those are some excellent points. And um, yes, I, I fully agree. And I think that this is, at this point in time, that this is a real life threat that organizations are faced with where yeah. everyone yeah. can have a comment because of the speed of the transmission of information, it can be very damaging. I mean, overnight, an entity can be faced with a challenge that can topple them. Um, and if if the communication is we we've seen we've seen numerous examples of this, you know, especially in the post pandemic um era in Trinidad and Tobago and in the region. Um, I just want to now move across to some of the comments that we have on our chat. I'm seeing Derek. It is evident that time has come to redefine organizational value and hence redefine stakeholder in the context of the emerging triple bottom line. And I think that point has been really emphasized and underscored by each of our panelists. And it's a theme that Kamala has been really promoting since in, through the CCGI. So I think everyone now who has attended a CCGI conference or a classroom session or a lunchroom or, or, or any sort of discussion knows about the emerging triple bottom line and how we are to manage it. Um, Cecile uh, Watson here has a point about Misha's point, the point, love the point of fit for purpose. Um, again, another very important point that was made earlier. So we see some themes that are resonating. And Dennis, the point that boards ignore the change imperatives at their own peril um, and, 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 and the board's response to shifts. You see someone here has some nice points again here. Well, thanks to see for that. Yeah, so um, it was Cecile who was uh, responding to some of the, the comments. Unfortunately, yes. she had to leave us. That's a leave. So yeah. now I'm going to open it up. If it's okay, Kamala, I think if we, we sure. can just open it up for any sort of questions from our participants. I know it's been a long day, but this has been a very rich and engaging discussion. I've learned a lot in the last hour. I'm sure all of you have. Absolutely. I, I did. I could tell you, I, I am listening here and I'm realizing how much, you know, you, you, you think you know so much until you hear so much more. And, and what really, for me, was significant coming out of this panel discussion is that there are lessons within the region for us to analyze to further understand how it applies. So what, what Gail spoke about with TSTT and the, the fact that it was stakeholders through social media who would have raised a level of awareness that clamored for there needs to be a response and we mm -hmm. want an urgent response. And then that just kind of created a, a, a whole upheaval uh, with, with TSTT. But I also had not thought deeply, and, 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 and this is something, again, because we need time to look at this, eh? but Misha, that, that story you shared of NCB, really and truly, how many examples do we have like that where, you know, the major stakeholder will just walk in and say, listen, I really own this place, you know, and I am not happy with how you are running this board. So please, you know, take your exit and let me put in place what I think, you know, is best. Th these are things that we need to capture as case studies. Yes. And, and we need to understand the implications of that. Yes. Um, Tamla, I, I thought it was, as I studied um, and prepared for this, I thought it was an excellent um, case study because I myself kind of got bits and pieces um, of, of when this was actually happening. 
on social media and some of it yes was was not positive and and some of it led led me to question and as some persons were you know you know, is something happening to to in in the in is it is it is there some level of instability in in the company but when i looked and thought and opted to use it as a case study and and kind of deep dive into the research i was i realized this whole concept of the fact that you you have where institutional um, shareholders have that consciousness that as he did that he's not only just thinking about himself he's thinking about pensioners he's thinking about all the different um, shareholders and beneficiaries of that company and 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 thinking that fundamentally what was happening required. And, and and this is probably a case study for even the, when you want to say maybe we have not had the kind of le level of evolutionary change that is necessary when we talk about regenerate regenerative capitalism and the kind of um, um radical shifts that are needed but it's a start and and I think earlier one person spoke to the fact that where you see incremental progress being made we have to we have to understand that it is. It 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 can it can catalyze other forms of change and and therefore to me when you look at it, Kamala, it's not just an interesting case study, but it certainly can become something that eventually will cap catalyze other um company um shareholders understanding that um they, they have to become more 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 of an activist and more of getting involved in 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 um demanding the kind of changes that are needed and i as i thought about even the book um the from Prof professor bob garrett about the, the fish rotting yeah. from the head and, yeah. and and it comes back to all the discussions that have been happening that the changes have to fundamentally come from leaders who are who are conscious leaders and I, and I feel this he and I could define uh, Michael Leachin when I, I studied that as somebody who was a conscious um, shareholder yes he was feeling it in his pocket certainly that was what what triggered it but it also led him to say that there has to be also fundamental management changes if 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 um because what was happening in terms of the governance and 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 the the level of efficiency was not acceptable, so. And, and there was something that Dennis spoke to directly. He said, "It's important for us to also first ask what exactly do our shareholders want." Mm -hmm. It's not to be taken for granted, right? Because the, the, the NCB story, I I think to touch on. And I, I know bits and uh, similar to yourself, Misha, that what the effectiveness of that board has to be brought into question. And who chaired the board? Mm -hmm. that, uh, <laughs> there, there's a similar but different story with TCL and Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. Where this time it wasn't a, a a majority shareholder, it was several shareholders who got together and decided that similarly they felt that the board was not functioning in the interest of shareholders. The, the share price was low; they were not getting dividends, and they just felt it was time to to make a, a drastic change. And and that was a whole dramatic thing happening in Trinidad and Tobago where the board refused to be moved and they, they filed an injunction to prevent the the shareholder meeting that would have led to the change in board and stuff. So we do have some stories to tell in yep. the Caribbean region here. What we need to do is also find some time to study them. To study yeah. them, absolutely. I had another one, Pamela, but I was so conscious of time and the fact that we've been running late. But the the Barbados Public Workers um, Cooperative Credit Union. And again, it's from, from the media report, but there was a, a, a particular shareholder who um, was speaking on behalf of a group of, 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 of shareholders who dubbed themselves concerned members of the credit union. 
and they have for a, it says it's a decade you know it's after a decade that they have been raising ongoing concerns about inadequate rules governance um concerns that they say have resulted in 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 what they feel was um the, the mismanagement and that was what after a decade triggered in recent times a forensic audit of the of the credit union um and that they the 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 activists and spokesperson said that the forensic audit that was triggered of, of one branch the report on the findings she felt was something that um was symptomatic of or a snapshot of the general issues that was happening with the credit union and and her 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 clarion call was the fact that um you know attention has to be paid for for what's taking place like in that credit union because of course she, her, her she had to she was drawing reference to what happened with Clico and what the outcome was again was that that activism led to not just the audit but then, of course, a new board and a new management structure, um, and and some and streamlining of 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 an address in order to address some of the governance um concerns, um raised. So I think this this it's it's such a it's such a pity that we have come to the end of the day, and, and it has been a long one. But I I'm truly fascinated by this this topic of the power and the interplay between stakeholder activism and shareholder activism. And I really want to thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this panel discussion, to, to speak and to really kind of deep dive as in the short time that we were given on this topic. Well, I, I love it, Misha. And um, so before I ask Miriam to, to ask all panelists for closing uh, comments, I, I, I want to tell you that I, I truly appreciate the, the value that you have brought, all of you. And, and Misha, you and I need to talk because I think there's a, there's a ways for us to collaborate. We can share resources so these stories can be captured so that across the region we can all benefit. So, you know, it, it, it leads to greater action than, than what we are currently doing. So every time, you know, as we get together, we learn, we can take further and further movements in that direction that we want to go. So I, I truly appreciate um, yeah. having you here as well. So Maryam, we, we are just about 20 minutes um, past six o'clock and uh, I think it may be a good time for you to ask your panelists to wrap up. Yes, okay. Well, thank you very much, panelists. So I'll start with the gentleman, Mr. <laughs> Harris. Um, <laughs> what would be okay, your takeaway you. on your wrap-up points? I, uh, yeah. no, thank you very much. I think I think it's you know a very rich session. Um and you know, feedback has, has been great. I think my three points, one really is to emphasize that the fiduciary duty of the board of directors. And I don't think we can ignore that they have a major responsibility in terms of managing um, the business and ultimately um, activism that comes comes from that. And, you know, I think Gail, you know, touched it on how you deal with situations and and communication. Um, and I think, you know, I, I love the old thing about the fact that technology could drive activism. Um, some positive, some negative, but it could be a, a, a paradigm shift in the way that things things are done in the future. So I think that that to me is is, is important. Um, and the reality that it cannot be ignored. The, the, the board is going to ignore this at their peril because I think it you know it, it will eventually come to the Caribbean one way or the other. Um, the, 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 the third point really is about how do we get engagement from those companies that are majority owned by family owned, uh, you know, eight, eight, 70 or eighty percent of their shares are owned by, by, by one person or one family. Um, how do we get them on board, right? And I think it's a, it's, it's really something that we need to put our heads together with, um, and see how we can actually, you know, get that change where activism. So, you know, shareholders feel that they do have a voice, right? Um, to help that company, help companies grow. Okay, thank you for those points. And now, Misha, what would be 
Your Thanks. Take I, I'm going to piggyback on Dennis' um, point, and I, I, I too agree that in the age of, of social media, there will continue to be increase and, and increased access to information. There, I feel that in terms of future trend, there will be continue to be strong um, stakeholder activism because the, their platform itself allows for more more voices to be heard, and 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 for stakeholders to certainly be able to 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 effectively mobilize um, across global the global platforms. Um, support. So what happens in Trinidad, certainly the rest of the region will be able to weigh in on it. But I, I, I say that governance also has to then be applied to, to how we use these social platforms um, because the, the power and the influence can certainly harm and do damage um, negatively. And, and so that is one takeaway. The, the second one I have is, is the point I made that uh, there is growing need for conscious business and conscious business leaders and therefore, and, and for the consciousness to, to translate to intrinsic long-term um, changes in management structures and even um, organizational structures that will, will ensure that shift that we speak about, that is the shift from the primacy, primacy on um, shareholder value to more um, the the enterprise value creation, which is is which is another term, and that is how the 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 value how, how the value of the company's output is impacting the environment and the community and the people. And that too, I believe, is also something that I see a shift happening as well. And we we have to then begin to, to encourage that activism. I, I want to end by saying that platforms like CCGI that continues to not only give space to the conversation, but it also allow for the training of the new, the future, or the new, 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 new thought leaders and new persons who sit on the board. Then we we have to then become the catalyst for the change. We sit on boards. We are being trained. We are benefiting from the value of the information. We then have to become the catalyst of change. But I and but finally, I think it was Ronald who said it on Saturday. We also have a generation of youngsters who are not no longer patient and or tolerant of some things, and that is also going to be that 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 grouping who are going to be lead that ground swell towards the dis, the disruptive changes that we need in in some of the organizational models um board levels um that we see so those are my thoughts and thank you again for the opportunity thank you very much Misha and uh... Now, lastly, Gail, you get the last two minutes. <laughs> okay, all right. So I think I just want to use that time to speak to a point that um, Misha has raised a couple of times in terms of conscious capitalism and regenerative capitalism. I think that there are two schools of thought that, from where I sit, can work in tandem with each other one does not necessarily need to come before the other because they, they both serve the same master, but from different um, points. So with conscious capitalism, you're looking at a higher purpose, stakeholder orientation. You're looking at a conscious culture. You're looking at prioritizing ethics. Um, on the counterbalance to that is the regenerative capitalism where you have a more a holistic approach that looks for systemic uh, change. You're looking at your circular economies. You're looking at equity and justice. And they're very complementary to each other. Um, I've been fortunate, I would say, to be exposed to both schools of thought because being in Massey, it was something that at a point we were all challenged to really get our hands deep in conscious capitalism and understand what that meant for us as, as an individual, as a team, and then as an entity. And 
then you 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 start to hear the rumblings of regenerative capitalism and, and Kamala knows this from the last conversation she and I had. I don't think that that regenerative capitalism requires an evolution. It requires a return because the roots of uh, the roots of regenerative capitalism sit within the the Maasai tribe, the Inuit tribe, the Amara tribe, the Zuni tribes, because that is where their their, their tribal culture was rooted. And, and I would keep saying that when you think about the tribal nations, they thought about creating more for the generations to come. They thought about this balance between themselves as the leaders and the people they served. And that is what sits at the core of regenerative capitalism. And that is what we're called upon to think about when we speak about conscious capitalism. So it's not this new thing. It is asking us to almost like like the, 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 the skin of a snake to shed the things that we have taken on that have caused us to lose, lose touch with being thinking net positive and thinking what do we leave for seven generations ahead of us and go back to that space where we understand that leadership is about service. That's what it is. It's it's not about the titles and, and you know, all of the power that we wield. It's we're called upon to serve, to do this beautiful thing called serving. So how do we get back into that? How do we create the structures, the programs, the processes, the policies? And how do we create the people who have the mindset to show up and serve? And, and serving also means to listen, which is where we create that space for that stakeholder, shareholder activism. So it's it really is a remembrance of the things that worked to create balance and to preserve the environment that we need to sustain life and livelihoods that we've forgotten over time because we may have as, as a human collective gotten too too hyper focused on consumerism and what we can gather and store for ourselves and not serve to produce for others. So at, at the end of it, I think the clarion call is for us to remember the things that anchored us and our ancestors in the past? And how do we bring that into a techno technologically, uh, digitally diverse space and make that count for something that matters? So ultimately, I would like to close the way my colleagues started, which is offering gratitude to CCGI for this platform and for the opportunity to sit with my two uh, co-panelists I definitely have learned. Um, a lot. I thank them for the knowledge sharing and for the awareness. And I am definitely supportive of the entire week and the journey that would come down in terms of the knowledge to be shared and to be taken up. So thanks again. And thanks to you, Miriam, for your time um, moderating us today. Okay, thank you, everyone. So thank you thank very much, you. Kamala, for this opportunity. And I think we've learned a lot. We're at the end of a very long day and I'll hand it back over to you now.